a lot of times buyers in that market have a house to sell and they're seeing how long it's taking for houses to sell. So they're putting in conditions or longer conditions. They're kind of a little bit tempted, I gotta say, like they would a little scared to put in a, an offer before they to buy something, even to capitalize on a buyer's market without selling their property. Resale activity that surged to 44% in October compared to last year. So what buyer demographics are you seeing that are driving this increase and what properties are they typically focusing on? You'll see now there's a, like on House Sigma, there's something called an escape clause. So the reason why a seller may want to do this is they usually put in there and say, okay, fine, we'll give you that 30 days, but I want a higher price, right? Because you're screwing me over for other people coming in. So chances are you want a higher price. And the second thing they want to do is an escape clause. Welcome back to episode 101 of the DC Talks podcast. Wow, episode 100. I hope you enjoyed that episode we had last week about the fake moon landing. and uh, Supposed fake? Supposedly fake moon landing. You know, even watching it back. Or supposedly myself, real. Supposedly, I don't know. Whatever everything, you like. Everything. Everything, quote unquote, supposedly. Like everything that went into that was, you know, they're never going to come back and say the truth because this is going to disrupt everything. But we have passed the episode 100 threshold. Now we're entering Ooh. a new... Echelon episode 101 DC. Yeah. How so are you good. feeling about that episode 101? Yeah, it's, I can't believe it flew by that quickly, right? It's I know. like, it doesn't feel like it's been a couple of years already. So, yeah. can you actually believe that? It's actually been a couple of years. I know. I know. I, I, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like that's been that fast. So, yeah. Anyway, like, sorry, it hasn't feel like that long, but it just feels like it, we just started this thing. I know. Yeah. yeah. And even this year, like, it just went by so quick. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe it. It's honestly, you know, it always feels like you're living for like the next opportunity. There's like moments I have where like, let's say Raptors, I'm always like looking forward to the next game. Like I kind of like see my life as certain anchors. Mm. Okay. When's the next game? Okay. Playoffs, certain things. Okay. July. When's 3rd. the next championship? When's the next championship? <laughs> Never. As a Leafs fan, <laughs> you must have like that. Hey, we're not talking about the Leafs. Let's get into the market <laughs> stuff here, man. Like, I don't know. This year, at least the Leafs at this point, uh, Austin Matthews has been out for eight games and Toronto's won seven of the eight games, which mm -hmm. is cool. So like this is recording. I think we're, we're populating this next week anyway. So hopefully uh, tonight he'll come back and if he comes back, they lose. Who knows? Anyway, like, so this is recorded before the, this, uh, the obviously before the game. So let's yeah. see what happens. But, Listen, all those diehard Leaf fans, mm -hmm. you know, we have something, uh, you know, to, to cheer for this year. It looks a little bit better, but you never know. I all like, right, let's jump into this pod because we can talk about sports all day. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm easing into it. I just. We can't ease. We talked about this before. People, listeners want to know what's going on. What's going on this episode, buddy? All right. All right. Let's get into it. So <laughs> Urban Nation um, came out with a report. This is like a report. Just like you know, So Urban Nation is like an economic, it's a it's an economic company, mm -hmm. what they do. And so, and so my brokerage, uh, we have sold rights to this Urban Nation report for mm -hmm. real estate. We're the only company that does that. So they, my, my office pays a large a lot of money, amount of money. Then we get the Urban Nation report once a month. Mm -hmm. And we obviously can't share it with everybody because it's, you know, proprietary information. Um, but we do, we do get slides. We're able to share snippets of it. And I, I share it with you, obviously, yeah. because we're not producing this anywhere else. We're talking about about it, which we're allowed to, they want us to talk about it. Okay. And so what it is, it talks about all of like the market. Like when we talked about those stats last time about what was uh, like the pre-construction stuff mm -hmm. too, a lot of that came from the Urban Nation report and mm -hmm. it's an invaluable resource that we have. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, so, so Sean Hildebrand comes mm -hmm. and like, he presents to us at least a couple, like, I don't know, like twice a year or something like that. But mm -hmm. when he talks, like I guess they allot him like an hour, he talks for like 90 minutes and we're all like, holy, he's got so much insight into the market. Yeah, And it's like, he bestows upon us as in, like, it's just, profound every time he talks so I'm like mm -hmm. you don't want to miss those episodes and mm -hmm. uh with royal page signature what they do a lot of times they'll record like if it's a live feed and stuff they'll mm -hmm. record it and they'll play it back for us so we have this information mm -hmm. but again it's an invaluable resource in which we have a royal page signature we're the only brokerage that does this yes so we get some as you saw i sent you the report yeah, it's, it's detailed it's right very, like it's very, very detailed very detailed you know so there's a lot of things that you can take away there from uh interest rate cuts sales surge listings and market balance uh, prices on the rise, condo market shifts, and also the buyer activity under one million. Um, when you first got the report and you got a chance to like go over, what are some of the things that stood out to you? 
So the funny thing is, like, I wonder, I actually went through with the broker record. He went through it, yeah. and one of the things that kind of stuck out to me it was like we're talking about like the you know they give us a bullet points and they're saying you know buyers return like a resale activity in the GTA mm-hmm. is surged. It says you know it's forty four percent in October compared to a year ago. So the total, total amount of sales we had was six thousand six hundred fifty eight sales, which represents a three year high, right? Mm-hmm. Which is great, right? And sales are within fifteen percent of a ten average. Of, like so, they're still below the 10 average rate. So these are kinds of things that stuck up in my mind. But what I did is I said, well, I wanted to look in October and say, well, great, we had six, eight, you know, we're always selling the good stuff. It's, and we're trying to explain how things are rebounding, but mm-hmm. by no sense of the imagination, are we back to regular purchasing, right? Yeah. We're still low. Like this year, we were hoping to hit like, you know, 70,000. Mm-hmm. And what it looks like now, we're not gonna hit that mark. Last mm-hmm. year, we were at 68,000, just under 69,000, I believe it was. And I don't think we're gonna repeat that amount. We're gonna be less than 70,000. Mm-hmm. We thought this year was gonna be a new year with the interest rate cuts and yeah. more activity. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing, even though like we're saying buyers are returning, mm-hmm. they're not coming back in droves like mm-hmm. we thought that they would. Not droves, but at least coming back to the market. Yes. And one of the things, uh, I thought was very interesting. It was like another company, uh, which I was attending to. He brought up a good point. It was Graybrook. Now, Graybrook mm-hmm. is one of these companies. They work with pre-construction. They work with investors. They work with mm-hmm. builders. And they bring projects to fruition. And he brought up a valid point, mm-hmm. and which you know I thought about, but I liked what he was saying. He was, uh, why are we still like struggling the last two years, even with interest rate cuts, with buyers coming to the market? Now, Grant, granted, this is good news, but mm-hmm. you got to remember, guys, we're still below the 10-year average rate for October. Yeah. Like, we're still low. So that like, well, why is that? Well, when interest rates were as low as they were in 2021 and 20, sorry, 2020, 2021, after the pandemic, what it does, it took people off the sidelines who were looking to probably purchase or put the house up for sale in probably mm-hmm. 2024, 2025, and it moved them up a couple of years mm-hmm. because fear of missing out mm-hmm. of the low interest rates, fear of like, you know, the market, there was no inventory in the market. The media was saying like, you'll never be able to afford a home by now. Mm-hmm. So some of that demand, which was we were hoping to get these years and maybe even next year, got pushed forward. Mm-hmm. So demand was, that's why it was so high, because that's why we haven't seen it before. And now, you know, demand is starting to catch up to the 10-year average rate, but we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of things that, that, that was one of the things that really stuck out in my mind. Yeah. And then the other thing that stuck <laughs> in my mind, if you don't mind me continuing on this, no, what's the on. second bullet point yep. was growth and new sales, sorry, uh, and new listings have slowed down. Mm-hmm. So these are, that's another big bullet point. When we were in the pandemic and just past the pandemic, one of the things we kept talking about was like months of inventory and listings. Mm-hmm. We need inventory. We need products. You're putting, you were literally putting a house, you put a sales sign on the lawn. And you had a lineup of people wanting, I'll pay on, they're overpaying for it. It was ridiculous, right? It was mm-hmm. just not a good market for that, believe it or not. But, and lately we've noticed that still, but we had, in those times, I remember seeing like in the GTA, like eight, 9,000 listings, for, like new listings for the whole year, whole month. Yeah. Ridiculous. We got up to about 25,000 this last couple mm-hmm. of months, right? So it's like, that's it. Now we're in a different sp- space. That was a little higher than we need, right? Mm-hmm. So we went from months of inventory, Again, that's a stat in mm-hmm. which we compare, uh, like how much, if, if no new houses came to the market, how long would it take for all the existing inventory to sell out if sales continued at the same rate? Mm-hmm. And what that does, it gives us an indication what type of market you're in. Mm-hmm. So for example, if you had, you know, oh shit, <laughs> if you had 10,000 listings mm-hmm. and you had 2,000 sales, mm-hmm. right? It's five months worth of uh, less of that's five months worth of inventory, right? Yes, yes. Well, during the pandemic, sorry, so another thing is like, so between zero to two months of inventory, mm-hmm. you're looking at, that's a seller's market because things are selling quickly, right? You know, anywhere from, I've heard from two to three, almost four months is kind of in a balanced market. Yep. Anything, you know, three to four months is a, is a buyer's market, right? Okay. We last month had a buyer's market. We had over five months worth of inventory, mm-hmm. clearly in a buyer's market. And now yeah. we're closer to equilibrium. We're about three months because the inventory came down from the 25,000. So we, so new listings, you know, they increased 4% annually, mm-hmm. but a slower pace compared to the 10% annual increase in September, right? So mm-hmm. there was a little bit of a pullback of, of inventory that came down. Yeah. So now we're, we're, we're more of a balance or again, we're, we have a, just under 25,000 listings, you know, or, or uh, new listings. Mm-hmm. So it's getting us closer to a balanced market, I would say. Mm -hmm. So that is also significant as well, right? That means two things, purchasing because 
the purchase uh, purchases went up mm -hmm. and inventory came down that's why months of inventory also decreased. So mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a couple of variables that affect that. That's again for a market that's good. An equilibrium market is a good market. You yes. want I, I would personally say I would like an equilibrium market, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be able to buy something and sell something. It's equilibrium market is a good market for both sides. Mm -hmm. Like there's not one side advantage over another. So yeah, I think we're we're approaching an era where we're starting to get our footing. So getting back to you know a regular market. Yes. Um, I went over the Sorry, report. is that long-winded? <laughs> no, no, no. I think it teased me up because what I wanted to do is like I went through the report and I actually um, wanted to ask you some couple questions from the different things that we spoke about from mm -hmm. the interest rate cuts, sales surge, the listings, prices on the rise, and also like the condo market shifts. Yep. And I found like the best way to deliver the value to the audience was to me to ask you certain questions, uh, you know, to make use, the best use of the time, like not kind of like rapid fire, but more so like, where people can actually digest all the information at once. Sure. So one thing you mentioned was the um, resale activity that surged to 44%, correct? Mm. Um, in October compared to last year. So what buyer demographics are you seeing that are driving this increase and what properties are they typically focusing on? So the condo market is still, there was a surge in, in, in sales in condo yeah. market, but we're still not there yet. The condo mm -hmm. market is still like a great opportunity for buyers to get in and get a ridiculous deal. And then I think buyers are seeing that. But below that million dollar mark is always the most activity we've seen. Mm -hmm. And also the luxury market, you know, over the $3 million mark, we're still seeing mm -hmm. sales, right? Really? So the hardest market we've, oh, we're have we seeing the type of this is we're seeing in that middle range, mm -hmm. right? It's anywhere between the one and a half million to the two and a half million dollar range. Mm -hmm. And the reason I would say for that is most of the time is because a lot of times buyers in that market have a house to sell mm -hmm. and they're seeing how long it's taking for houses to sell. So they're putting in conditions or longer conditions. They're kind of a little bit, you know, tempted, I gotta say, like they would a little scared to put in an offer before they to buy something, mm -hmm. even to capitalize on a buyer's market yeah. without selling their property. Mm -hmm. So they're also, that's why you're seeing an inventory increase because they're looking to buy, yeah. but they want to put their house up for sale first. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, again, they're in the same market, they're buying and selling the same market, but it's, we're seeing sometimes conditions of houses like, well, you know, sale of a house, right? I hate that condition. Like, you know, so <laughs> what it is like, and there's a condition of a sale of a home. So for example, if you wanted to put a, a, an offer on your home, you're able to, and I don't recommend it, I don't recommend it for my, my sellers, right? But you can do it, oh, sorry, my buyers or my clients, I don't recommend it. You can put a condition of sale of your home. Now, what it, you what happens in that condition of sale is that you give you have a condition you give the sellers um, an alt, an alt, an option to get out as well right mm -hmm. so you have to right so so say I come to you and I want to say listen Owen I want to buy your home yeah. right but I'm going to give you a condition of sale of my home before me able to firm it up right we'll get a home inspection we can get financing but we won't firm up this deal until I sell my home now if you're in this situation you're going to be like well why would I do this right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have my house sold conditionally for it. It's usually around 30 days, right? So what happens is that like sometimes buyers won't come and look at your home because you're sold conditionally. They're figuring, well, it might sell, might firm up, right? Mm -hmm. But you'll see now there's a, like on House Sigma, there's something called an escape clause, right? So the reason why a seller may wanna do this is they usually put in there and say, okay, fine, we'll give you that 30 days, but I want a higher price right? Because you're screwing me over for other people coming in. So yes. chances are you want a higher price. Yep. And the second thing they want to do is an escape clause, mm -hmm. which means an escape clause is if a new buyer comes in because mm -hmm. you're sold conditionally and gives you an offer on, can give you an offer in a home. Now you have to go back to the first buyers and say, okay, you have, you know, 24, 48 hours, whatever it is to, to match the to, offer to no to firm up your deal. Okay. Or sign a mutual release. So you walk away and we can work with the new buyers. Mm. So one of my saying, clients just had that we just bought that house that way so firm firm up means that if you come to me yeah since the second buyer wants to give me a higher price yeah that means i have to if by firming up i come back to you and i'm like, okay wave the condition that's wave. right get rid of the condition and now i'm 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 guaranteed not guaranteed I'm, I'm committing to buy your home yeah right yes or the other option is back away mm. walk away from the deal what if that other person is not ready to firm up? Like the, the bad. then you have to walk away. You have to have to do a mutual release. Yeah. So, for example, my mm -hmm. clients just bought a property. It was on the market. It's on the market, and it only works for houses that have been on the market for a long time. Mm -hmm. Because I had somebody ask me that we had a like wet house 
you remember Mike Austin? So we put up Mike yeah, Austin's yeah, yeah. house for sale. Yeah. Then the first, first week he's like, we'll put a, we had a buyer saying, I want to give you a condition of sale of our home. I'm like, why would I tie up my property? It's been on the market for a week. Like yes. most buyers haven't seen it. Yeah. Now I'm on the market five months. Mm -hmm. My clients are like, most people that wanted to see this house have already seen it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Then I'll, 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 I'll entertain that mm -hmm. condition of the sale of your home. Yeah. Makes sense? Yes. And this one was like, they had a couple of price changes mm -hmm. and then we noticed it was sold conditionally. So we went mm -hmm. to go see it. Mm -hmm. I call up the agent and I said, before we give it an offer, it's like, how's this condition looking? And he was honest with me. He goes, listen, Dave, we just had to extend that condition because they didn't sell. And I saw their property because in the offer, they have to tell you that the address, so you can follow the, the buyers, sorry, mm -hmm. the sellers can follow along, mm -hmm. seeing how the sales come along because they want to know if their house is going to firm up. Yes. And he's like, I don't see any activity. I really don't think they're going to be able to firm it up. So mm -hmm. I give you the green light. Give us an offer. Yeah. So we negotiated back and forth, some of it through text message. But so we got it on paper and he went back to the sellers and they, we gave them 50 hours, mm -hmm. five zero. 50. <laughs> five zero. Well, instead of two days, so okay. just two, two hours more than 48 hours. Yeah. And we said, we'll give you a condition. This, our, our condition is you have to get a mutual release from another one in order to firm this up. So he had to go back to the first buyers that had the property sold conditionally. And he, that's what he said to him. He goes, mm -hmm. either you're going to commit to buying this house mm -hmm. or tear up the contract basically yeah. with a mutual release and go back. And that's oh, what we right. did. And we ended up getting a good deal on the property and mm -hmm. both sides are happy. That's good. One thing you mentioned was that the condo market was the one that's like most active with a lot more buyers coming in with everything that's happened in the past 44. One of the, one of the graphs also showcased that high end a high end sales over 2 million mm -hmm. increased sharply in October, mm -hmm. right? So when you look at this compared to the condo market and also the high end side of things, what factors have driven that high end side of things over 2 million in this past month when you also like look at condos as well because this is like yeah. a sharp increase than what you've been normally seeing. Well, I get it. I think a lot of it has to do with affordability, yeah. right? That, that extra, that 50 basis points that they mm -hmm. see continued basis point increase. Now, the over the three, the luxury market, they're not as sensitive to interest rate cuts mm -hmm. as, you know, under that mark, like, you know, they're in that range of straight cuts. But for over the $2 million market, that's like I said, that's the average, that's not, not average, but like, like household income, like that's on the higher echelon. Like, yeah, that extra 50 basis point cut, I think really helped. And we see further cuts. The indication of the Bank of Canada was they're going to be more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So I think now they're actually, because we had the, the first three cuts were like quarter of a point here, a quarter of a point there. We're like, mm -hmm. yeah, these assholes are going to, you know, going to increase rates again. We, I don't think there was a lot of confidence in the market. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what was driving a huge portion of that over the three, over the $2 million mark to purchase. Mm -hmm. Now over the luxury market, it's different. Again, it's including that luxury market. Okay. The luxury market doesn't, they don't care as much about interest rates. They, right? don't say, they, they, got the money. they have the money. <laughs> yeah. It's nice. Don't get me wrong. They save some money. It's nice, but that's not going to deter them from purchasing the house they want. Mm -hmm. Must be, nice, eh? must, must be nice, eh? Must be nice. Must be nice, nice being a multimillionaire. Like, ah, yeah, yeah. Screw it. You know, it is what it Actually, is. Actually, my, it was, um, on a side note, I just had my, uh, my doctors, my, you know, once every four months we did our, our blood yeah, work and Dr. Up. Knipping and I were talking and he's like, and he goes, I have some people wanting to be a billionaires and in his practice, he has four billionaires, he four, billionaire? four billionaires in his practice. And he's like, do you know how many of them are happy? Uh, let me guess, like maybe one out of the four, one out of the four. And he, so, so he, when he has clients come and they say they want to make a lot of money billionaire, he's like, I don't suggest you doing that. He's like, one, mm -hmm. he goes, well, there's a 75% failure rate of happiness for a billionaire. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, my point is that like, my point is like, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, right? Mm -hmm. But not having the money doesn't also, <laughs> and that's other stressors. So on that topic, I've always been curious, like, how do you not, how are you not happy with that amount of money? Like, what is it that that's not fulfilling you with the heart? Yeah, I believe you're, you're believing God. I believe in your heart and your family. Like a lot of times those people are chasing something which they'll never be fulfilled and they're mm. just never satisfied, right? Mm. And like, you know, it's, and it always reminds me of Hamilton, right? Uh, the, the, the musical. The, the musical? Yeah. I haven't actually watched Hamilton. Oh my God. Don't talk to me. I watched it twice. It was amazing. Um, mm. Even got my, my kids have seen it too. Like, yeah, yeah, it's great. So one of the parts is like the, the, the song is like, it, it repeats over and over again. Mm. You'll never be satisfied. You'll mm. never, and if you watch the musical, you'll see like until he's come to grips with God and stuff mm -hmm. too, I think uh, like, that's what I get from it. He was never really satisfied. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes, sorry, I don't want to preach to people saying like, but that's, I, I believe that too. Like I'm happy. I really, I'm like, 
I couldn't like I remember a couple of years ago I wasn't you know I was my faith wasn't there like relationships weren't good like COVID did a lot of stuff to us and messed us up and the, the, the I I truly believe it doesn't matter the amount of money you have if you're not happy the person yourself mm -hmm. there's no amount of money it's gonna make you happy yeah so I, but, it does, but it does help a little bit <laughs> it does help yeah it does <laughs> but that shit goes away man like think I mean, about it like what they say it's better to be sad in like a in a boat in the in the okay. in Greece or something like that, enjoying yeah. some good food, right? Then yeah. should be sad and like, of course, living a pauper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 for sure. But but if money really buy you happiness, then how come there's only so many suicides in Hollywood and stuff, right? So think about that. Well, yeah, I think that might be a Diddy story, though. I mean, there might be some psychological issues there, but <laughs> yeah, well, we can touch upon that in the, yeah. the next couple episodes. Yeah, but uh, to go back to the report uh going up to a couple of questions I also had right sure is um you know we focused on the increase in like the in the luxury market the condo side mm -hmm. but we also saw the detached detached home prices in toronto grew by four percent while condo prices in the 905 region also declined right so mm -hmm. what regional dynamics are you seeing that are shift are making these numbers for example um like causing these disparities like where condo you gotta markets, remember condos <sighs> There is a large concentration of condos across the GTA in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So when you're going outside the Toronto core, I would mm -hmm. say like any kind of fluctuations, like a price here and there or the last, like will fluctuate in price. Mm -hmm. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. For okay. Like in Oakville, for example, there's not a ton of condos mm -hmm. in Oakville, right? Yeah, yeah. They're mostly detached, detached houses. houses yeah. So if one house sells and sells higher or doesn't sell, it affects the market. So when you're reading these reports, that's why I would say like that, you, you got to take it with a grain of salt mm. and you have to understand that Toronto, yeah, like it's more, you have to concentrate more on, you know, the, the, the Toronto market with the condo market makes more sense. Yes. And look at sometimes outside other areas. Now, like Mississauga is starting to build a lot of condos. We can look at that market okay. and in fact, but again, be careful because the 905 encompasses everything else besides the 416. Mm. So you kind of take it with a grain of salt and that's why it affects. And the demographics, they're like people were in of that course. area is like families right. and like more established. Right. They're looking for like more. Well, condos more are space. built for Toronto, like as, uh, for cities, yeah. right? So, if, you know, if you have larger cities that move like mm -hmm. like hamilton's got a is getting a decent amount of condos now like and they're building more mm -hmm. uh then you got like like i said mississauga like and 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 toronto right obviously outside of those those urban like areas i don't know like where you would buy a ton of condos like oh mm -hmm. obviously like you got kitchener waterloo that's building in that area i have my condos there they're doing very very well mm -hmm. but like again you got to be careful where you're looking for it and Obviously, university towns also, they're starting to build more condos and purposeful rentals as well for those, for, for, uh, for students. Yeah, no, that's, that's facts as well. Um, on, the, full of full, <laughs> on the mortgage side, right? Uh, part of the report also showcased that the CMHC insurance limit increased to 1.5 is expected to- Has not yet, yes. Is expected. Is expected, yep. To shift growth in the low rise market. So how might this affect the affordability for first time buyers? Huge. 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 We don't know why they kept, I'm saying us as an industry it hold. So mm -hmm. I would say years ago when they implemented the CMHC, there was a cap on it. So what it was is that anything you purchase over a million dollars, you have to qualify, sorry, you have to put 20% down, right? Anything under 20% is considered a high risk mortgage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the threshold before that, I don't know what the threshold was before. I don't think there was a threshold before you're allowed to put 20%, mm -hmm. less than 20% down on a purchase. Mm -hmm. They put a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, I think it was well, 2016 or something. I can't remember when it was. And they said, now anything over a million dollars, you have to put 20% down. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is, is that the prices went gangbusters, right? Like the prices increased so much that now this, this $1 million mark, mm -hmm. which they've left for years and years and years mm -hmm. has been the line in the sand mm -hmm. and it should have moved with inflation. Mm -hmm. So now they're finally catching up. They moved it to 1.5. So what you're saying now is like, and that becomes as a fact as of December the 15th. So after December the 15th, if you purchase a property that's one under 1.5, not 1.5, so one million four hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, right? You don't have to put twenty percent down, depending on how much you're everything else. You can put fifteen percent down, you can put ten percent down. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That I mean that frees up mm -hmm. a large amount of capital, like of deposit that mm -hmm. sorry, down payment that you don't have to come up with. Most people were struggling coming up with the down payment. Mm -hmm. The day to day stuff they can come with, but it's like 
you know, think about it at over a million dollars. That's $200,000. Yeah. So Owen, if you bought a property at $999,999 and you're going to put 10% down, mm -hmm. you know, that's a hundred grand. I put a dollar more. I have to come up with $200,000. Mm -hmm. See, there was a little bit of a disconnect there yeah, yeah. where the young people, as we're noticing now, are a lot of these people are maybe their second time buyers. I mean, not the first time home buyers, but second time home buyers are trying to get out of a condo and trying to get like a semi detached or a townhouse. That $1.5 million mark is, is really going to help them a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, not all of them are going to buy, mm -hmm. you know, that price. They're probably going to buy just over a million dollars. It just opens up that whole segment of just over a million dollars. We needed to do this beforehand because again, with inflation, where things were going, that, that line in the sand stayed where it was. Mm -hmm. It should have been moving. It should have been a moving target. Yeah. And that's what most people agree. So this does help home buyers. Now, what also is helping first time home buyers is also that 30 year amortization schedule, right? So amortization is the amount of period you need to pay off a mortgage. So if you buy a property, oh, when you do it 20 years, you buy a million dollar property, you put it in 25 years. I'm going to put it, I'm going to say I'm going to amortize it over 30 years. Mm -hmm. The difference is it's going to take me five more years to pay off, right? Mm -hmm. And I am going to pay five more years of interest, but my month to month is going to be less than yours because we're stretching over 30 years. Yeah. So the cash flow is beneficial to buyers. It's also beneficial to investors mm -hmm. because investors are looking for cash flow. And you got to remember, we don't mind having a longer interest period of time because you write off as an investor in a yeah. property, you write off your interest. Yeah. It's like free money. It's a write off, right? It's right? <laughs> <laughs> Creek. Anyway. Um, yeah, but this is, it's a write off for us. Right. Okay. So the longer amortization schedule for investors, mm -hmm. we love it. Like I told you before, I had a 40 year amortization. Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it. I'm still paying off. I'm, I don't want to pay yeah. it off. If they can give me, if, and I think it's down to like 23 years, mm -hmm. I would love for them to extend it to 40 years again, mm -hmm. because the amount of interest, I don't expect to pay off this property. I use equity from my, I mean, investment yeah, properties I mean, that buy other investment properties. And again, the and interest it's cash flow is cash flow, right? And that's it's cash flow positive most yeah. of the time when you're amortizing it mm -hmm. and you're able to pull equity from it as well. Mm -hmm. no. So it's timing the market, right? Timing the market. Chris Slightum, our CFO. Yes. Well, yes, our broker of record. He always tells us you got to remind your clients it's time in the market, not timing the market. Because anytime you hold the property, if you hold it long enough, it'll earn you money. Mm -hmm. For example, when the average sale price in February, 2022 was at a $1.33 mm -hmm. million dollar average sale price. We're not back to that, but if you hold on to your property for 10 years, you don't care, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's gonna be past the one, in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Time is gonna keep going. Time is gonna, gonna, gonna be living, so it yeah, might as well. So I remember when 2016, mm -hmm. remember people were complaining like, oh my God, I overpaid in 2016, blah, blah. It took two years to get back to that average sale price. Mm -hmm. And then they're in the money. Most people were moving in two years anyway. I always tell my, my clients, your investment, doesn't matter if it's your matrimonial home, doesn't matter if it's your first home, does, it doesn't matter what purchase you're having, it should be a long-term investment. Yes. You should never look to buy and sell within two years. Mm -hmm. You're paying land transfer tax, you're paying lawyer fees, you're paying realtor fees. Even if you make $100,000 on sale, you've, you've pissed it all away with all those additional fees, fees and you could be losing money. Mm -hmm. Even if you made $100,000 on paper. Mm -hmm. So you have to, that's it, not time in the market, time in the market, mm -hmm. take your time. Most properties of the way that the average sale price works was that I think we were between six and 7%. So uh, over the last 30 years, of annualized growth, right? And that's straight line over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And depending on the year, it was fluctuating within that. And it's like, it's going anywhere between 6.3 and 6.7% roughly, mm -hmm. right? So that means like if you hold on to your property long enough and you average also for another 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. you can look, there could be a six year percent growth mm -hmm. compounded per annual yeah. in the, the year you've owned it. Yeah, I was even having the same conversation with my mom as well, cause uh, her and my dad own a property in London and if you look at the area as well, like the development of the area, so you have the college, you have Western right there. Yeah. And a lot of the people in the area, they're actually destroying some of their, the existing properties and actually doing new builds as well. So the value of the land that the property, that our current property is on right now, yeah. she was telling me like, you know, oh, like when I move back to Nairobi, you and your sisters can actually do something with this because, and I was, it took me back to the conversation we had with uh, the gentleman who was here talking about the garden suites, right? Yes. And I was telling him, like, you know, we had 
someone who came on Chanelli's podcast and he was talking about this whole thing about garden suites. And she said, oh yeah, what is that? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I mean, look at the backyard of this thing. Look at how we have this driveway that extends to the back. We can do something with the backside of that, especially with the students who are living in this area. You know, like we can actually build something with it. So she was just super excited because she wanted to sell it because I think my dad, when uh, he closed his business, my dad was doing like a bookkeeping, accounting, taxes and everything. He's been in like, this was his side thing when he was doing like outside of work. So he was using part of that house as an office as well, too. Mm -hmm. So when he moved back to Sarnia, we had to sell that property, mm -hmm. made some decent change with it. Well, they did. But uh, this property, she's just like, you know, um, I don't want to sell it. I don't want to do anything, but I'm kind of like looking into the future with you and your sisters. And I'm like looking at all these houses are being built and just the curb appeal and the value of the houses mm. here. It's going to make everything go up. So I'm like, yeah, 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 for sure. So I'm the whole garden suite thing when we yeah. spoke with, uh, what's his name again? I forgot his name, but yeah, but I, but I always tell your parents and I say this to a lot of people, especially at your age, if you have the property, there's only two times you sell an investment property. Mm -hmm. The first time you sell an investment property is because you're buying to upgrade your investment mm -hmm. property. You're selling this property to buy something as an upgrade, mm -hmm. whether it's cash flow, bigger property. The second time is when you need to sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the third property I always say is like, forget about number two, because there's always a way to figure out to not to sell your property. Like I say pulling equity, there's always a chance yeah. of whether you repurpose it. Like mm -hmm. I don't always, like we don't like selling investment properties mm -hmm. unless you have to. And mm -hmm. I always say like the only time, the only caveat, the only time we've ever had to sell an investment properties is when a developer was going to build around us. And he's like basically said to us, you're either in the development or we'll build around you and your value will drop. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be careful. So I would always say like, yeah, like listen, if you and your sister to take over the property at a garden suite or talk to develop, help develop the land, you can become part of that, right? Mm -hmm. Without without selling it. But if you end up selling it, you can sell to a developer because what they're looking for is not the actual property. They're looking at future value and the density, how yeah. much they can build on that. Mm -hmm. And it should be, your price should be based on the density. Mm -hmm. Density means the amount of properties they can build on that, how much cash flow they can get, how many, like, so if you're building a condo, for example, you're, you're looking at a house, looking at a building, the cash flow may be worth $4 million, mm -hmm. but the future value of it, because they can build up, is probably worth six. Yeah. So if you were to sell that one, sell it for the higher value of the density, right? Which we can get, that's a whole other story, not the current value of it. Mm -hmm. And then take that money with you and your sister and buy another investment property to earn that. No, DC. or three or four, and that way you make more trees to build more cash flow. If you if you see the the the, the plot that this house is on, mm -hmm. and you look the surrounding areas and everything that's coming up, like my prediction in the next 10, 15, 20 years, that place is going to be booming. It's going to be a gold mine. So, I mean, I'm excited. By the same time, like when you look at that you think about oh man i'm 30 i'm 50 by the time you feel you, there's this like instant gratification you have with real estate because you want it now you want to have the cash flow now people are not willing to be patient enough to really see things pay off yeah. and i can be a victim of that too so my mom's talking to me about this i'm looking at man i'll be 50 by the time like this thing but then what's wrong with being almost 50. i mean not hey, isaac is doing to me <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's been wrong with fifty, but I think you wanna you wanna feel the, the all I'm saying is by the time you're that age, your you know, your That's cerebral good. cortex will be developed, and you might be able to think a little bit curly. You know, we have to wrap up, right? I know, I know. I'm, I'm going to wrap <laughs> so. it up right now. Um, but uh, to wrap things up, right? <laughs> See, you just ruined my flow. <laughs> It's DC talks, it's not double O talks. <laughs> it's, it's conversational. It's conversational. I know, but um, going back to the report, right? Uh, to conclude it. Right. There's a lot of stats that we shared. There's a lot of things, but where do you see the momentum going into 2025 yeah. based on what you saw from this? So, uh, based on what we're seeing now and like, like 2025 looks like it's going to continue the momentum. So the, the latter half of October really picked up. That's mm -hmm. where most of the sales were happening because mm -hmm. there's a lot of anticipation on October 23rd for those interest rates to decrease. Mm -hmm. The momentum's kind of slowed a little bit right here in November. Uh, but there is another interest rate announcement, which is December 11th. Mm. So I think a lot of people are still waiting to see what happens December 11th. I do believe there's going to be a small increase. I don't think it's going to be a 50 basis point increase. I would love to see it. I know, like, listen, at the end of the day, I own variable mortgages. I would love to see a 50 basis or 75 basis point. I think it's going to be a little bit, but I think we're going to get more aggressive in the new year. Okay. Right. Uh, because, you know, inflation went 
back up to 2%. But again, a lot of that has to do with like housing costs, et cetera, and, and gas. So there's sometimes it's out of our control. So we're back at a 2%. We're still within the 2 to 3% mm -hmm. inflation rate. Mm -hmm. So I don't anticipate December is going to be a huge cut. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but that being said, you know, I, there's a lot of people still suffering. We still need relief, right? And we've talked about this a lot of like on the other podcasts. So, so I really believe that the beginning of 2025 will be a little slower start, mm -hmm. but it's just seasonal, Season, right? Yeah. That's more seasonal than anything else, especially if, you know, two reports. One report says we're going to have a warmer uh, winter with less snow. But I just talked to my hairdresser yesterday. She heard all the opposite. It's going to be a crazy. Thing. So who knows, right? The amount of snow affects the amount of sales we have. But spring, I'm really looking forward to spring 2025. I have like five or six listings already lined up for it. I think a lot of people are just, they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. I think it's going to be a great, I think it's going to be a great spring. I think the market is going to be more of a balanced, I don't think it's going to be a seller's market, but it'd be closer to a seller's market than a buyer's market. And I, what's going to happen in that kind of situation is that the condo market eventually will get pulled up. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the condo market slowly start to increase. It mm -hmm. was the only segment of in the 416 that did not have an average price increase when it came to all other homes. So detached, semi-detached, and townhomes all had, in, in October, all had average uh, price increases. Mm -hmm. The condo market had a 1% decrease, mm -hmm. okay, in average sale price. Mm -hmm. But what happens now is that the delta, the change between the, the detached market is what you have to pay attention to. And the delta between that and the condo market when the gap gets too large which means if the detached market continues to rapidly increase what happens is that the lower market also will start to increase they want the gap starts to get closer because once it gets too far other people are going to opt out of the detached market and start to buy other other types of homes semi-detached yeah. the town homes and that forces the people that would have been in those markets mm -hmm. down into the condo markets mm -hmm. and then it will raise it up Mm -hmm. but there's like a trigger point and then i don't can't always tell you what that delta is but yeah. but as the that delta widens you'll start to see a decrease again mm -hmm. so the condo market is going to take a little bit longer because that detached segment has to increase a little bit more for that delta to be almost not unbearable but almost unsustainable and it will drive up the condo market condo sales amazing dc thank you so much for that strong breakdown and all the knowledge that you just shared in this episode if you want to learn more, if you want to ask more questions to David, make sure you hit him up on Instagram at David V. Cinelli underscore Realtor, or you can hit him up at dcinelli at realpage.ca if you have any more in-depth questions or you want to set up a meeting. Uh, this has been great. Uh, episode 101, uh, passing the 100 threshold mark has been amazing. And uh, we will see you in episode two with Jeff Sling. Sling. Slidem. Slidem. Yeah. Slidem. So he's the other brother. So the Slidem brothers are the ones that own Royal Page Signature. Yes. Slidem family. So yes. yeah, he, he handles our pre-construction. So yeah, looking forward to seeing Jeff. All right. Make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next episode. Peace out.